And here we're lucky to have two views of front and back and hands to the breast gesture, the legs together, very, very reminiscent of the Paleolithic uh, grandmother of Lespugue in, in France, in the Southwest of France. And we see this also in Villendorf and other figurines that it may be that these were made with kind of a tapered ending in order to be placed into the ground in order to stand them up. So we come to Chatal Huyuk. And this is the site that most people, most of the women, spirituality folk that have been drawn to Anatolia really uh, focus on because there's the most information available about it. You can see that they too have these very squat, shortened figures, seated figures. Look at the, the buildup of uh, minerals on there, sign of great age. And this one is the most famous, which is called the goddess of the granary because she was found inside a granary. And the idea of increase, protection, lots of different meanings that uh, attaches to that. So we have a couple different views of her. This is what I was talking about. I'm going to give you a back view in a moment of the cap. She has these, many people read these as serpents coming over her shoulders. I, I suppose it could also be regarded as a garment, but she's not really wearing anything else. So I'll go with the snakes. And she's flanked by leopards. So here we're looking at the oldest, and we are talking about 5800 BCE in that neighborhood, the most ancient form of the great goddess Kibele, who we'll come into later on, seated on a throne flanked by lions, and she takes other forms as well. This lump here has been regarded as a head of a child coming between her legs, which is one possible interpretation that has been disputed. So you know, there's a lot of interpretation involved in, in all of this. But instead of lions in this archaic period, they're leopards. And we're going to see that again when we come to uh, Hasilar. So the back view shows us that it may not be a cat, but there's actually this coil, like almost like a snake coil, that probably represents a braid that's wrapped around her head. And you can see the tails of the snakes, the, the uh, panthers, beautifully modeled body and these very heavy, voluptuously fat upper arms are something that we see also at Malta, Sesclo, many of the Mediterranean sites, which most of which date later in um, Greece and central Mediterranean and in Sardinia and different places. So here's a correlate to that figurine, a lot of similarities in her that was found just only a few years ago and very beautifully modeled, hands to the breast, full articulation of the face, hanging belly. These represent not only fat women, but mature women, and possibly women also who have borne many children, you know, the loss of, of tone in the belly. The leg, the feet are not naturalistic. They're kind of more like pegs. So you see a little glimpse of that abstraction uh, creeping in there. Here's another one seated. There are quite a few of them with their legs drawn up, hands to the breasts. This is two views. Some of the, uh, Ian Harder, who is the current archaeologist at Chatel Huyuk, really has minimized the fact that the figurines they found are female by in an interview with Joan Marler, uh, talks about, well, you know, that we only found 10 or 15 of them. But those, those are the, the sculptural icons that exist. And you'll see one example of a, a male that I found. But lots of women seated, the, the legs drawn up, body painted, this ochre patterns of quadrants, other symbols across her body, two views of the same piece. The nipples and the belly button articulated. A lot of them, the heads are gone, including this one. And Joan Marler has pointed to this as kind of a dual theme where the hands to the breast is the life giver gesture here in the front and possibly also pregnant. And then the back, she's the crone with her ribs sticking out. And Marler reads this as the death aspect, something that really coincides with the iconography of the Kalyach in Ireland and even in, in Britain, because she is hairless, maybe 
very thin breasts or no breasts, breasts really de-emphasize in favor of the vulva, but the ribs sticking out. And so very, the crone asks this very, very old woman. And yet she is shown also and spoken about in the folklore as the progenitor. And we do, do see what appears to be a scene of impregnation, the lovemaking on one side, and then the woman with a child at her breast, a rather large child <laughs> in, in the other. The idea that women continue to suckle children for years is not unusual at all. In many Aboriginal societies, women will continue nursing children, not just till they're two, but sometimes still giving them breast if they come for it, four, five, six years old. So this is like a whole theme of motherhood that takes a very different shape in, in a non-patriarchal context, a form of bonding. And here's the male figurine seated on what appears to be some animal. I couldn't really say yet. Maybe it's intended to be a leopard because there's the spots, but the spots really are also maybe an indication of, of numinous power. And they've rubbed clay into the indentations there to bring out the contrast. This is what the village might've looked like. Very closely packed together complexes of houses. You can see little courtyards in there in places, but the roofs, a lot of action happens on the roofs and, and the community is able to see each other and call across to each other from the rooftops. Women are coming up here to do their work. Here they've shown flocks. So the, the Chateau Huyuk begins as a foraging society, hunting and gathering. And then later on, they begin to farm and they even begin to have herds of animals. So there's a long, maybe 1500 year uh, uninterrupted uh, existence of this village. And people continued to rebuild the houses. The, the adobe walls might crumble at some point and they would just level it out and build up on over it, which is also how these tells are built up. They, they kind of grow upwards. Inside the buildings, you have the framing out of rooms or enclosures, and some of them you could actually just step over. They have uh, horns. So bovine symbolism is really, really big at Chateau Huyuk. First, they're hunting the, 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 the bulls, and then later on, they're embedding them in the walls of the houses. And you can see some traces of reliefs on the walls here. Here we're looking at some of the oldest layers when it really is the, the period of hunters and gathering. Gigantic red ochre bull, hunters all around. You have this one lone female figure where we see a close up of her here. Again, the hands to the breast gesture, the long breasts, along with, I don't know, it looks like a warthog or something. I'm not really sure what that's supposed to be. But what's interesting with these hunters is that you see African attributes and the way that the hair is rendered on this figure. And this corresponds to what we know, the Natufians coming up out of Africa into the, the Canaanite world. They're wearing actually leopard skin. Uh, I don't know what those are, whether they're supposed to be stiff or whether they're kind of blowing in the wind. But we also see here's some more of the, the patterns on some of the wall murals that they've been able to recover. Here, here's a, a sketch of one of the mural, this is the hunting mural that we saw before. And you can see, again, these sort of stiff leopard skin um, kilts or whatever you want to call them. And the African features, the profiles on these figures really correspond a lot with Saharan art and also with South African art, uh, come to that. They're holding bows and arrows and there was not a lot of weaponry in these societies except for hunting. So they have knives, they have bows and arrows, and we do find maces in the later uh, layers. And there is some examples of skulls that have been crushed. So it's not a violence free society, but it's not, it's a very stable society because they're living very close together. And, and there's not a lot of other influence. It doesn't, doesn't seem like there were wars going on. Maybe sometimes uh, violent outbreaks happen. Uh, inside the community. Leopards, so here again, the leopards appear facing each other, kind of a coat of arms type of expression and various other ochre patterns painted on the walls. 
These are kind of interesting. These could represent breasts, handprints. This is a Paleolithic theme that we see in some of the very oldest layers of culture in the rock art in South America, in Australia, in Paleolithic Europe, various places. These handprints are kind of a signature for, for archaic human art. And then we have these birthing figures who's uh, maybe they're double jointed, but the legs are, are raised in a sort of unusual pattern, but very abstract. The head has never been fully recovered. This is just the surviving pieces of, of formed plaster. Here's a better photo because you can see more clearly the paint. And again, red ochre patterns all over the body, concentric circles representing the belly. So I really do see this as the progenitrix, the clan ancestral grandmother who is featured on the walls. This is not at all something unusual. In major cultural societies, you will see this also from Southern Germany in the Neolithic. You'll see it in more recent periods among the Nuba in central Sudan, where they have the breasts of the ancestral mother. On, on the walls of the houses. This is a sketch of this same figure where they did find on the floor some of these huge horns. And so this is one visualization, uh, kind of a fanciful one to some degree. We don't really know where they, these were placed. And here's another of these ancestral figures with the parted legs. So another, another way of representing the life giver, but she's present in the household. By the way, none of this, very little of this has been excavated. Most of what you're seeing here is from Mellart's excavations, which were done much more quickly and Hodder is going a lot slower. And most of the site still remains to be uncovered. But back to the theme of death, because this set of murals, uh, we call it the vulture shrine, this is from Mellart, is you have vultures feeding on corpses and they're all headless. So the skulls have already been removed. And this was something that was practiced in Southwest Asia. You see it in much later periods as a form of ancestral presence or heirlooms in uh, the South Pacific among other places. So the, the, the removal of the skull. So they're headless, but they're, they practice something called excarnation which is that they would take the dead up to high places, the vultures would feed off them and remove all of the flesh. And then the bones would be lovingly collected back up and buried under the platforms in some of these houses. Now that was not exclusively the way and Hodder has highlighted that there are actual straight up burials as well in some of these sites, but burial of the ancestral dead under the houses or sometimes under the eaves outside the houses, particularly with, uh, young, with babies, is something that's very widespread as a pattern, uh, particularly all through Southern Asia in the Neolithic period. So they, these, these double spiral patterns etched into the clay. And I would expect that this would be done by women, yeah, you know, women artists who may have also been the ones modeling this, this clay. I mean, we can't prove that ceramic work was always done by women, but that is the global pattern as a rule. And only later does it get taken over by men as the professionalization proceeds. This one has obsidian eyes inlaid to them. And the pottery. So I just found these recently. You don't see a lot of pictures of pottery from Chatal Huyuk. Hasilar, another story. And you can see these two have a very similar motif of these interlocking triangles or perhaps mountain patterns, possible vulva lozenge there, zigzags. And uh, these are drawings. So reconstructions, this lower row is the same kind of painted pottery. Nipples show up on these. And we will see that a few other places, I think. And this upper row, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm assuming these are ceramic, but these are very shallow bowls or basins with uh, these patterns. These are kind of amazing and I would love to get photographs instead of drawings of this. You can see the crack marks. So we, we probably only just have this much of, of the picture, but you have a woman 
the head, the shoulders, the hips, the breasts, and the vul vulva delta. This is probably also a, a female figure with the eyes, the head, the arms, and the hands to the breast gesture. Even the vulva is incorporated, which is also what we may be seeing here. And then also, there's like 10 or 12 obsidian mirrors. You can see the size of them that have been found in women's burials at Chatal Huyuk. And if we can just leave aside for a moment the idea idea of female vanity and how they had to see if they look pretty. There are other more sacral aspects to mirrors that we know historically in scrying or divination, gazing into polished surfaces or bowls of waters in order to prophecy and to divine. This is an interesting one, which is from Chatal Huyuk, where you have the double goddess two heads, two sets of breasts, and then the whole rest of the body is single. And so we can take this perhaps as sisterhood inside a matrilineal kin society, or you know, you could go to the lesbian side and you know, talk about female bonding in another sense. But this is not the only form of these double figurines, which you also find in Greece, by the way. But here's another one, and I have not been able to find a site for this one, only just an approximate date but very realistic women, arms around each other. This is actually a full female pair, not a, not a double goddess in that same way. Uh, again, the accretions of minerals be due to extreme age. So we come to Hasilar. This is a village that is, a, I don't know, maybe a couple hundred kilometers away from Chatal Huyuk to its west. Slightly later in time, the, the base date would be around 5500 BCE. And the, the really thing that stands out about the many clay figurines of women here is how many of them are body painted. They have these typical elongated heads, probably bound the skull in, in order to get this effect. Like they do, you do see skull binding in Iran and the Jarmo culture and some other places, elongated slanted eyes, the hands to the je breast gesture over and over again, but full body paint up in red ochre. And we'll see that in seated and crouching figures, standing figures, there's just a lot of these. Very beautifully modeled, some of them quite voluptuously proportioned. This one's amazing. It's just so beautiful. So lots of uh, body paint up, as Aboriginal Australians talk about paint up as a ceremonial practice. And that's probably what we're looking at here is, you know, the, the, there are meanings to these patterns, uh, meanings attached to them. Of course, just adding ochre to the body, and you can see they're using white clay too, is, is applying a sacred essence to the body, but the patterns kind of shape it and give meaning, uh, direction to that intention. Asilar is in southwestern Turkey. It is about, well, I'm not sure how many miles, but it's it's well to the west of Chatel Huyuk. It's what they call the Lakes District, I think. A couple more standing figurines. Well, this one looks like she's partly immersed in red ochre. Again, you see almost this exact same formation of the upper body from the sesclo culture in Greece around the same time span. There's a couple of reclining figures that are kind of lying on their side. And this one is just the hands to the breast gesture. I assume that head is a reconstruction. And, but this one has a woman with what appears to be a much smaller lover and most of his body or her body is missing but you have a leg that's coiled up and wrapped around her. So this is very erotic. Uh, there, there's a certain amount of erotica, both of these sites, Sasilar and Chatal Huyuk. Here's another with a baby at her breast. Again, the upper body has been broken off, but the life giver comes through in a lot of this symbolism. This one's split, so we just have fragments of her. This typical way of sitting 
for a lot of the figurines at Hasilar. And then there are the women with the animals. Uh, it's been speculated that these are foxes, which do occur a lot in the art of Chantal Huyuk, and it's even been suggested by an Indian woman scholar that the fox was a psychopomp or one who conducts between worlds from the material world to the spirit world. She's got a little fox cub up on her chest. She's embracing, these are two views. And then note these, you can't really see it here, but these are feline, uh, a feline throne, which I'll, I'll have a drawing for you at some point that shows that more clearly. But here's another view of her. And we have this one with the fox cub, or maybe it's an otter, but I think it's a fox that she's holding in one of her arms. So they're actually keeping pets or animal companions, if you prefer. But this beautifully modeled woman with the fox in her arms, here's the drawing. So um, again, the feline throne that we saw at Chateau Huyuk is also present. Panthers, they would call them, or leopards in the literature. And she's embracing the little fox cub in her lap. So again, this is, this is a foreshadowing of Cabelli that we're going to see. And that's really important to see that there's this extremely long through line between the most archaic art that we still see continuing to appear 5,000 years later. You know, that's, that's pretty impressive. Here's another view of uh, standing with the fox, uh, different headdress on this one. But that life give, giver gesture comes through over and over again. A little bit of impasto rubbed into the figurine here. Abstract face. This one has caused a lot of speculation. And I, this is some of it. I mean, is she giving birth? Is this some form of ancient yoga? Is this a Sheila Nagig type figure with the, the you know, parting of the legs to show the vulva? What's interesting though, is this is the view from the bottom. She's made in such a way that she lies naturally on her belly with her legs drawn up. So extremely flexible hamstrings here. And then her upper body is coiled upward. We saw one example of this a little bit earlier, the one whose body was kind of twisted around and the head was missing, but she had the same gesture of the hands coming around to the breasts that we see here. So I should put those two closer together. And then uh, more examples of the life giver gesture. Like the art that you see in the Aegean, the other side of the Aegean over in on the Greek side, you see the squaring off of the arms that are reaching to the breasts. You'll see that at Sparta and a lot of other places. And then some more really finely sculptured, beautiful rendition of the breasts and belly very erotic looking in some of these. Now this is Hasilar, but I put this in from Malta to show you the similarity. This is the oldest layers of Malta clay figurine. And here, this is older, maybe by as much as a thousand years at Hasilar. The hands to the breast, but the long hanging breasts, the hanging belly, elder women as life givers or at least mature women, sort of a shared theme going on there. And then these amazing, magnificent ochre painted pots out of Hasilar. Here's one of the lower vessels with the quadrant pattern at the center, lots of curvilinear swoops and other shapes. Here's another one of the breast pot motifs. I have a whole show on the breast pots, but you've got the nipple, the areola, these concentric circles. So these seem to go all the way around. And we could look at this as a head, a torso and arms, or we could look at this as arms, torso, big vulvic triangle and parted legs. As you can see, they've recovered a lot of really amazing pottery. So there, here we're looking at villages where women are making the pottery and then painting it, inscribing it, with sacred signs, perhaps. There may have been meanings associated with these patterns. And a lot of this is very asymmetrical. It's these, these patterns here are very unique to Southwest Anatolia. 
or maybe Southern Anatolia as a whole. You could even argue for that to being a serpent. There are also pots, uh, what they call effigy vessels in, in the archeological rhetoric uh, of heads, heads of the ancestral mother or the entire body. Uh, she's a ritual vessel. So these are ceremonial pots. They're used in pouring perhaps libation or putting out offerings onto altars in honor of the ancestral mother, which runs into a continuum with the great goddess. So we could, we could call her the great mother that might split the difference most effectively. Here's two more examples of double goddess with the shared body. These are two different pots, but very similar kinds of linear body paint on them, hands to the breast, jointly in this case. More, so I call these mother pots. I, effigy vessel is just too, it's too abstract and it's too distancing. It's like, let's go back to some of the symbolic significance of what this must have meant. Note that the, the vulva is detailed on a couple of these different styles. So ceremonies that are centered around this maternal symbolism. And we also have animals. These types of animal vessels, this is another global pattern. We're seeing it here at Hasilar, but it also occurs in Czechoslovakia, in Argentina, in Missouri, Vietnam, all kinds of places that normally we don't hear anything about the archaeology of, but there's there are these global patterns. And I'm not saying they're related to each other in a in a diffusionist sense or in a the idea that these people went all these places, but they actually arise independently in human culture because of the kinds of meanings they carry, uh, the, the relation of these communities to the animal world and to the natural world. So this is another, now I'm gonna to come to some of the sites that are not as well known, which are really important. Bade Magasi is one of them and very similar to what we've been seeing from Hasilar. There's some other examples that are more unique these are probably a little bit later, I'm guessing. I don't have any dates on these, <laughs> but uh, some similarities to some of the cycladic figurines, but you've got these incised patterns on the bellies. And we also see stamp seals. This is a characteristic of the Neolithic cultures from Pakistan all the way out to the Aegean, actually across the Aegean into uh, Greece as well, in the Balkans. So we have swastikas, pre-desecrated long, long before the Nazis and other patterns. This is really an interesting one. So they have little handles that you can't see on it from, from this view that they would just be pressed down into the clay to make an impression. So these were either blessing symbols. They may have been associated with, with particular clans. We don't really know, but they're making the female figurines. And you can see a lot of these these are not necessarily artistic production. These are just individual creations inside the families that had a ceremonial significance. You can see all those little dotted patterns in there that indicate the circulation of energy, mostly marked with very prominent vulvas. We also have stone figures, or at least I'm judging these are stones. That looks like incised stone to me. And so the bottom row here from Hasilar, and we can see similar types from Badimagasi. I don't think that they're really very far away. I haven't gotten my maps together yet here. And then Huyusik, and they have both the figurines, a lot of the little crouching figurines, um, but also vessels like this one. And this is interesting because this eight pointed cross we see in other parts of the world also. It's a weaving motif for one thing. It shows up in Turkish kilims in much more recent times, but we also see this pattern in the Andes where it's known as the Tawachakana. This is a Quechua name for a symbol that's very important. So one, one of the symbols that we're gonna see here is the quadrant when we come to Kibele that shows up in some of her reliefs, which is the four, right? But a lot of parts of the world will also double it over to the eight. And we see this symbol showing up in Central Asia. It shows up in the borderlands of China. So it's very widespread. And then more of the figurines, the squat seated figurines from Husik. This one looks like it had a bone inserted into the clay. 
Here's actually a piece of carved bone. So you have the bone icons as well as the stone and clay ones and the grooves. They're actually just shaping this by rubbing back and forth, back and forth, create the vulva, the belly, the arms, the nose. And then Kurosai is another site that this may be possibly a male figurine with a very, very skinny penis, but uh, in similar form to what we've been seeing with the female figurines. And also interesting, like if it is male, the hands to the breast, but uh, here's a little view of the village plan. So very similar layout to a lot of these Neolithic villages, the shared walls between the different living areas. And they too created really beautiful pottery. This one amazes me. I wish we had the whole thing instead of this fragment. Again, those very heavy upper arms that you're seeing in Asia Minor and the Balkans. Here's another example of the frog-like birthing woman. Uh, where is that site? I'm not sure, Robin, what you, uh, which one you're talking about, sorry. Have these vessels been tested for plant residue? You know, I, I can't tell you that. I was lucky to even find photos of them. Site reports are like, I haven't gone that deep into, into these. I just found these pictures actually when I was in Austria and this woman had a book uh, with in German with the color, which I could not read, uh, with color photos of them, which is so precious because, you know, normally they just don't give a lot of importance to them. But lots of patterns, spirals recurring throughout this. The spiral and the step pattern, which you see a lot in the Americas. And you can see a lot of similarity here to the art from uh, Chatal Hoyuk and Hasilar, especially the latter. This one looks like a vulva sign to me. And one of the things I've become increasingly aware of in the past couple of years is the degree to which vulva signs appear on pottery. When I was putting together the Ceramica show, which is still available to the end of the month, by the way, you can get it on the same link as, as this one was on the press history site. Um, it shows up in the Pueblos, it shows up in so many different places. So just commenting on that. Their locations, those were from, uh, what was it called, Hurusik? Kurusai. And a lot of these, I don't know where they're from. This suggests again, the breast pot motif. And then we come to Kusk Huyuk. Huyuk means a tell, it's a mound where a city lived for so many thousands of years that it just built up and into a hill. And so uh, there's a lot of these in, in Southwestern Asia. And these are from that same German book where you have, there's a pottery fragment and they, they mold the dancing women onto the sides of the pot. So I would assume ceremonial pot. What's interesting about this one is that she has the invoking posture that you see so commonly in all forms of art, whether it's rock art or ceramic paintings or you name it in, in throughout the world, really. She has the female Delta very, clearly incised here. And she has her hair blowing in the wind. And this is a, a motif that I do go into in the Ceramica show because it turns up at Samara in Iraq, Neolithic village, and also in Pakistan in the, around the same time period. So this is a thing, it may indicate movement, but in some cases, this hair is also part of a pattern of swastikas on the painted ceramics at least. But nobody's heard of Kuskuyuk. And look what they've been hiding. <laughs> I mean, these amazing sculptures of dancers. These are both sides of the pot that are modeled onto what is probably a water pot. And then this. This to me is just, whoa. So amazing. The same kinds of shapes that we've been seeing from the standing and seated figurines, from all the sites we've been looking at. But they are arm in arm here, and they're dancing around the now broken pot. So they may have gone all the way around. And these are not skinny little girls. These are full bodied women, fat and stout. So that's, that's a real treasure. I, I consider this one of the most important
important things I've found in the last 15 years, at least. I mean, it's, it's just right up there ranking in the top. And others, we have the, the mother pots, little tiny breasts, hands reaching around in the life giver gesture and pieces of stone that are painted with ochre. And again, the vulvic pattern is, is the key theme there. And we also find female figurines. Similarities in the top knot, the elongated skull, the way the eyes are modeled. This time the arms are basically folded over the chest. We've got the big butt. But a lot of the stuff I found, I don't know where they're from. This looks very old to me, uh, you know, somewhere at least 4,000 BCE, maybe older. Again, this husky stout body, very solid. These are not wilting violets, these women. They're potent. 